Hello to our audience. Uh, Earth.org is a not-for-profit environmental organization based in Hong Kong. Our aim is to bring attention to what is happening to natural ecosystems worldwide. And we advocate for sustainable economic policies for the protection, protection of the natural environment and an extension of governments or oversight to cover the global commons. Uh, with Earth.org Talks, we are engaging with inspiring change makers and thought leaders to share their opinions and knowledge with our global audience and all to bring attention to what we as humans are doing to our planet. And we would like to extend a very kind welcome to Elizabeth Colbert, a journalist and author. Uh, Elizabeth is a staff writer for The New Yorker and she previously wrote for The New York Times. She has received numerous journalistic awards for her writing. And in addition to her many contributions, she has also written several books, notably winning a Pulitzer Prize in 2015 for her book, The Sixth Extinction and A Natural History. And her most recent book, Under a White Sky, was published in February 2021. Uh, thank you for joining us, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I guess to start with, I just wanted to ask a little bit more broadly about the book. Um, you know, the, the subject matter that you're covering, it's quite, it's, it's not necessarily made for, let's say, bedtime reading. Uh, it's, it's scary stuff, you know, these topics. But reading your book, it's quite, um, it almost comes across as, as funny in a, a more kind of ironic or absurd way, just uh, these situations that we found ourselves in. And I was wondering if, um, if this was kind of a goal that you had in mind as you were writing your book, uh, just uh, to get it across this way with this tone. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's, the book is really meant to be a, a dark comedy. I think that there, you know, I, I, these are very, very serious subjects. Um, but I think that, you know, people grow a bit weary and turn away even from, you know, the tone of, of alarm and catastrophe. And so I was sort of a little bit trying to, you know, get around that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it definitely. It, you hear, you read a lot of stuff now that's quite um, kind of doomsday, um, very, very dire predictions of the future. And uh, but yeah, it, I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm I'm not in any way critical of that. I mean, I think the dire predictions are um, appropriate at this moment. But you know, I think that there's room for different voices and different tones, even even when we're talking about subjects as serious as this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely. It's, I think it definitely helps to take a step back and look at the bigger picture kind of the way you you put it uh, a little historical as well you kind of looked at history too which was which was really interesting and just seeing kind of like all the all the rabbit holes that we kind of fell into um some we didn't know some we did but it was definitely <laughs> it was yeah definitely human human folly is an endlessly entertaining uh subject right definitely um but i like i said a lot of i mean a lot of the people that we speak to definitely are quite um, pessimistic on, on almost. Um, and um, a lot of people, you know, they seem to think that we're, unless we kind of wake up right now, we're kind of on a path to a very, you know, ugly future. Um, kind of in your personal opinion, do you think we're sleepwalking our way in a way kind of to a hell on earth of kinds? Well, I don't know if I quite want to go as far as hell on earth, but absolutely, you know, yes, basically we're sleepwalking. We've been told, warned in innumerable times. Um, I think one thing that's really important to appreciate about climate change in particular is that there's a, a pretty significant time lag in the system. So I think you could say, you know, this summer in the US, terrible heat waves, terrible fire season. Uh, now we're hitting a what seems like likely to be a terrible hurricane season. Um, you could say, well, people are, you know, are finally kind of waking up to the dangers of climate change. The, the problem is that they're waking up to the dangers that exist right now, but there's already a great deal more damage built into this system. And this is why uh, climate scientists, you know, started warning back in the late 80s 
you know, really as, as early as the 60s, but, but really with a growing alarm in the late 80s that uh, we needed to really take action, you know, then. Now, since then, since that time, since the first IPCC report, more than half of the carbon that's in the atmosphere hum that humans have put up into the atmosphere because there's a lot of natural carbon, I want to be frank about that, um, has, has gone up there. So in the time that we've been warned, we haven't just not solved the problem, we've made it you know, twice as bad. Mm -hmm. And that is not a, you know, if, if you watch or an individual do something like that, you know, get a, some kind of diagnosis and proceed to do things, you know, proceed to double down on their bad behavior, you would say that person's a fool. And collectively, <clears throat> I think that's a judgment we have to render on ourselves. Right, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely, it was definitely quite alarming when we saw during COVID that even though emissions fell quite, quite, quite rapidly and quite dramatically, uh, carbon, atmospheric carbon levels, they, they just kept rising. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's, that's so important, such an important point to, to communicate and for people to understand, and that is that carbon is not, sorry, it's not like a lot of other pollutants where if you stopped emitting them, if you stopped emitting, you know, particulate matter, which is very dangerous, you know, responsible for a lot of lung disease, uh, if you stopped emitting that, you know, what was in the air would mostly fall out in a relatively short amount of time and your problem would be, you'd be well on your way to a solution. Mm -hmm. Carbon dioxide, for all intents and purposes, once you put it up there, it's up there, you know, for good. And that means, you know, when all, all of these pledges of net zero, that really means net zero, whatever you put up there, you've got to take out of there. And that's a very tall order. Right, right, right. And without even getting into the negative emissions kind of discussion, which is a whole other ball game. But um, so, so, I mean, that's kind of what your book is about pretty much just trying to find these kind of, or us desperately trying to find these solutions to, to get to these, these states of net zero or negative emissions eventually. Um, but what I really liked was the line at the end, uh, you know, you say that your book is about people trying to solve problems that were created by people trying to solve problems, <laughs> which um, is, I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's, uh, you talk about it in a, in this humorous way that we discussed, but I, I think it's also, it's quite remarkable that, you know, we've been able to come up with all these different solutions and all these really kind of like creative ways to, to get around things that, you know, in the past, no one could have ever imagined, you know, would have ever have been surmountable in any way. Um, so I guess, do you think that all these uh, kind of, all these solutions, all these fixes that we come up with, are they a testament to our kind of ingenuity as a species in some ways? Or is it more just us being overconfident, maybe even a little hubristic in, in our abilities and kind of what we're capable of? Well, I, I definitely think they're a testament to our ingenuity as a species. And you could argue the entire you know, global situation right now, which we find very alarming, or many of us find very alarming, is, is a testament to our ingenuity. I mean, you know, burning fossil fuels, that's, you know, that's pretty smart. You know, no other species figured that one out. Uh, and it gives you access to tremendous amounts of energy. And you know, at, the at the base are modern, industrial technological society is completely dependent on having discovered sources of energy, buried sources of energy. I, I don't think there's any way around that. Now, the question of whether looking ahead, and so we tend to have this uh, sense that whenever we hit a problem, um, well, someone's gonna figure something out to get us out of it. So, you know, here, one example would be, uh, about a century ago, or a bit more than a century ago, you know, people were very worried about uh, feeding the world. How are we going to feed the, the world's growing population um, with sources of nitrogen uh, being sort of depleted? Uh, and nitrogen is extremely important for soil, you know, fertility. 
uh, and for you know many thousands of years, people relied on either manure, you know, that was one source of nitrogen, or uh, you know legume crops, which can fix nitrogen. Okay, so that's you know just basic agricultural practice. But uh, you know, just at the point where you know we were really outstripping the ability of you know those sources to provide the use, usable nitrogen that that, that crops need, uh, we invest. You know, two Germans invented a process for uh, creating synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, and it's estimated that something like three billion people are alive today owing to synthetic fertilizers. Mm. Um, now, we are now, once again, food production is sort of plateauing. Our population continues to grow. Uh, you know, where do we go from here? Um, you know, there's a sense that, well, someone's going to figure something out. Uh, the same with climate change. We've created climate change. Someone's going to figure something out. You know, is that true? It's a very, very open question. Yeah, I mean, this kind of reliance on, um, We'll, we'll find the technology that we need uh, or, or making assumptions <laughs> now based on future technologies that at the moment don't exist or, or don't exist at, a, at scale. Um, I mean, it keeps you on the edge of your seat a little bit, just thinking um, these are a lot of promises that are being made. And I think everyone hopes we can keep them, but <laughs> no one really knows for sure if, if, if we can in time at least. Um, no, absolutely not. I think, you know, it, we're, we're, it's not what you'd want to gamble the future of a planet on. Right, yeah. Um, so another thing that kind of I saw as a common trend with all these solutions is that we're kind of, all of them are kind of a, an effort by humans to kind of categorize as separate to nature or external to nature in, in some way. And we kind of, we show this by kind of trying to control it. In, in our own way, right? And, but then, you know, we see that we, we aren't really separate to nature. It's, uh, I mean, we, we've seen this year with between wildfires and floods that, you know, there's not only are we part of nature, but we're, we're subject to it. We're, we're pretty much subject to its whims uh, whenever it feels like it. Um, and, but there's still kind of this, uh, again, like a little bit of hubris on our side that's just, um, I'm, I'm smart enough or we're smart enough that, you know, we can we can overcome these uh, these natural kind of impasses. Uh, do you think that what do you think it will take kind of to make us accept that we are you know ultimately a part of nature, or is this just a case of things kind of they have to get worse before they get better? Well, I, I think you know one of the one of the points of messages of, of of my book is that we are really you know it's 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 really almost antiquated to speak of humanity and nature these days as separate entities you know when when you're in the middle of a um hurricane these days let's say or you know being flooded out by a hurricane are you are you subject to the forces of nature there uh yes clearly and but you're also there's also a component of that that's human caused you know human there's a big human fingerprint on every uh weather event these these days and then there's a big um you know component of that that is part of the you know just inherent in the in the weather system has that and that inability to ex extricate ourselves from the natural world both in the sense of our our influence on it and once then once again also being subject to its you know at its mercy to a certain extent that's a very odd situation to be in and that is but that is the situation that we're in right now and you know what would it mean to um you know respect nature more or see ourselves as part of nature at this point is is pretty unclear once again that's that's sort of one of the themes of the book you know does does the situation that we're in call for even more intervention you know having screwed things up this badly having sort of taken become the dominant force on planet earth without even intending to, does that mean, you know, trying to exert, is, is the reasonable response now to try to exert more control in a more thoughtful way? Or is it to say, look, we are so bad at this, 
that we should try to do as little as possible uh, henceforth. And I don't think there's a clear answer to that. I think we've gotten ourselves you know, in a pretty big jam right now. And what you consider you know, hands off at this point even is, is complicated. I mean, you know, doing nothing about climate change is, is only, is, is making the problem worse. There's no, you know, there's no sort of getting out of dealing with this problem in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, I <clears throat> sorry. I, I really like that, that quote that you put in about, um, you know, we're, we're pretty much gods. So, you know, we might as well get good at it. Uh, but then, you added, you know, two or three variations to that quote as, as things get worse and as we become worse at being gods, uh, we kind of need to amend that statement, you know, every once in a while and just make it a, a little bit more kind of representative of the situation we're now in. Uh, and that's kind of our, our relationship with nature, kind of the, the, the path it's going down, it, it, it seems like sometimes. Well, that quote, you know, we are as gods and have to get good at it or some you know basically that's the quote it comes from Stuart Brand who is perhaps most famous for having edited the whole earth catalog back in the 60s and since has done a lot of really interesting work uh, in a lot of spaces very very smart guy um, but people have responded to that by saying you know I mean that's those are those are you know those are just words how's that and they're not necessarily you know you can be very powerful without necessarily being <laughs> godlike. Right. Uh, and so Ed Wilson, for example, respond, has responded to that by saying, well, we're, we're not, you know, really godlike, we're really kind of bumblers. We do not uh, have an omniscient view of these incredibly complicated systems. And so, you know, we're bound to sort of fail as gods. And, and then I also quote um, a British writer named Paul Kingsnorth who says, well, we're as gods, but we're, we're very destructive gods. We're the gods of destruction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that those quotes are all really interesting and thought provoking. Yeah, definitely. Very interesting interpretations almost of, 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 of the situation that, you know, it keeps evolving, you know, in front of us. Um, and everyone's kind of scrambling to catch up <laughs> to, to define it in some ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask about, uh, because they pop up a few times in, in several different chapters, um, the engineering core, right? Uh, you know, you talk about them in, at the beginning in the Chicago chapter, the Louisiana chapter, and later on in the, the Greenland chapter. Um, you know, they're kind of quite representative of, you know, these, these crazy techno fixes that we come up with, these engineering kind of, you know, miracles that, that you know, they, they, they come up with that seem kind of impossible at the time. Um, and, but then you also mentioned that they, uh, so when they were in Louisiana, they recommended against uh, protecting that, that one island, uh, Isla de Jean Charles, right? When it became threatened, um, mm -hmm. even though it would have been a, for a relatively marginal cost uh, relative to what they were spending up in Chicago, right? Well, I, I think you have, to, I don't, I think, I think that it was a very large cost. I mean, it was protecting a relatively small space at a very large cost, but they did, yes, they did recommend against it. They did recommend against that particular project. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but I mean, I guess, what, what do you think are the, for institutions and bodies like that, where do, what are, what are the motivations for, you know, a body like that? What, could be recommended for, or what justifies recommending something or recommending against something else? Um, what, do you, what do you think about that? Well, the US Army Corps of Engineers is, is a really interesting and very powerful um, entity uh, in the US. They were really you know, formed to do the engineering for, for the military, but now um, do a lot of major you know, water, water projects um and 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 will be heavily involved in you know are we going to put up a seawall to protect new york or to break you know miami the you the core of it and army car of engineers would be the group you know you'd sort of call on to to do that kind of work now they are very you know as the name suggests they are very committed to engineering 
as the solution. If the, if the solution doesn't involve engineering a ma you know, pretty massive engineering project, you don't call them the Army Corps of Engineers. So, you know, you could argue they have a sort of vested interest in these engineering solutions. Now, usually they're called in and they need a congressional appropriation. So, you know, it's not like the Army Corps of Engineers can just go off and do whatever it wants. It has to be basically called in. It will come up with, with a plan at, you know, as requested. And then in order to execute the plan, it will have to get, in many, many cases, a huge congressional appropriation. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, you know, many people would say the Corps' record environmentally, you know, is quite disastrous. You know, it's been responsible for a lot of projects that once again had support, had political support. That's the only way they can do anything, um, but did not take into account the adequately the impacts down the road, you know, the environmental impacts. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the question of whether we should reevaluate, you know, in the in the US, I can really only speak for the US, some of these massive, you know, another um, entity, government entity that did a lot, a lot of massive infrastructure projects is the Bureau of Reclamation, which is really responsible for water, uh, you know, delivering water in the Western US. And it was spent many decades, you know, basically damming up every possible water way in the American West. Now we have a big drought uh, in the West. They've had to announce, just had to announce water cutbacks. Um, the question of whether you can keep solving these problems or dealing with these problems by you know building out or whether you really need to fundamentally rethink a lot of things uh, i think that's one of many questions before us right now mm -hmm. yeah definitely um and i mean this whole because that is always you know uh, a big component in any of these decisions is the, the political side of it um is there the political will to do it? Is there kind of the, the long-term kind of, is, is it a long-term project? Is it a short-term project? Is it gonna affect, you know, voters in any way? Um, you know, that's always like a, a big part of it. Uh, and that's kind of my next question too. Uh, you know, you always, once these solutions that you talk about are enacted, you know, they, they become quite difficult to walk away from and not really because, you know, there aren't better, alternatives available, but just because uh, politically it's very difficult to do it, you know, once, once, once it's set up. And I noticed that in the, in the New Orleans uh, chapter specifically, I mean, it's, uh, there was just this layers on layers of layers of, of exceedingly complicated kind of fixes and, and there was just a political kind of stasis and, you know, just um, figuring something else out or looking at alternatives. Um, so, I mean, can you, could you speak to that a little bit? Just why is it that officials, political officials or elected officials, they can become so entrenched in, you know, specific solutions that we don't really stop to consider alternatives? Well, I think that the problem is, you know, really profound and it almost transcends, you know, politics as we know it. People are very, uh, you know, loss aversion um, sort of, classic concept, I guess, in, I don't, I don't know if you'd say psychology or behavioral economics, but, you know, people react to losses more keenly uh, than gains even. Um, and they are extremely, you know, are, are, even though the world, you know, the world is changing really fast on many levels, um, we're at, you know, we're pretty change averse. You know, if someone tells you, well, you know, your house is in the wrong place, you really ought to get up and move it or move out of this neighborhood because it's, you know, we're gonna let it flood. Uh, you know, you think of yourself and you think, well, I, I wouldn't be too keen on that. And then you multiply that, you know, by hundreds, thousands, millions of people and you get a pretty big um, political problem. And I think that, you know, the problem isn't just that politicians don't want to think differently. The, the reason politicians don't want to think differently is because their constituents don't really particularly want to think differently because thinking differently, I mean, let's take the, the case of New Orleans. So New Orleans is uh, a city that was built on a piece of land that is strategically, you know, 
wonderful sort of sometimes called you know in the inevitable city is built where the Mississippi basically hits the Gulf of Mexico so you know crucially important in a day where you're shipping goods by boat um, but it that piece of land geologically speaking was temporary it was a um, piece of land that had been created by the Mississippi flooding over many you know hundreds of years uh, it laid down this, you know, mucky sediment. Uh, and over time, in the natural course of events, the Mississippi would have changed course uh, again, laid down a new bulge of land, and this bulge of land would have just, you know, sunk away eventually. Now, once you put a city there, you can't really let that happen. Uh, so this New Orleans has basically been a, you know, a 300 year effort. It was founded in 1718 to control the Mississippi River with the result that New Orleans is now the, one of the fastest you know, sinking places on earth. Now the only quote unquote solution, the only real solution to that would be to you know, let the river and the sea reclaim the city the way you know, they want to. These are very powerful forces. Uh, but you know, there are, I don't know what the latest population of New Orleans is, but you know, at least a half a million, probably a million people, uh, perhaps more dependent, living in or around, or depending on the city of New Orleans. So, you know, that does not seem to be a viable solution. So you have to try to work around this incredible geological uh, problem. And that, you know, is the subject of, of one of the chapters. How do you work around that? And, you know, once again, there's a lot of human ingenuity being brought to bear on this. And the question of, of whether that could be sufficient, whether you can really ever, you know, fight geology this way, uh, you know, remains to be seen. I mean, ultimately, eventually, I think the answer is no, you can't, but you might eke another 300 years out, you know, it's not impossible. Yeah, and I, it feels like there's many, you know, there's many similar places uh, where, you know, we just have these huge cities that sprang up in places that climate change or no climate change, you probably like you wouldn't probably want 24 million people living in Southern California because um, right. wildfires are, are a natural thing there. It's, it's not, uh, I mean, climate change might make them worse, but um, so, and there, there's, it feels like Hong Kong itself too, the, the places that um, when you step back and look at it, you ask, should there really be that many people living there? Um, yes, yes. And the, the precisely the, you know, features that often attracted pe people original, the original, you know, sort of founders of the city or whatever. And New Orleans is a case where we can really pinpoint the founding of the city, you know, um, to, you know, down to the, basically the week that it was, that it was uh, the French decided to settle it. Um, you know, they, they have to do with access to water um, and, you know, other, you know, generally, generally access to water. And at a time when you're uh, changing the hydrological cycle and raising sea levels, these, you know, most, many, I shouldn't say most, many, many of the major cities in the world are going to be facing very serious problems and very serious questions about, you know, how much of the land that we're on, some cities are built on fill you know, uh, mm -hmm. can be, can be protected. It's, it's an, it's kind of a new ball game. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, we haven't really been through this cycle before. I mean, all of these problems, you know, we haven't really, you know, had enormous cities of many millions of people for that long. Uh, and we certainly haven't had them in the face of rising, rapidly rising sea levels. So, you know, these are all open questions. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's definitely something we we see here. You know, in Hong Kong, we just uh, between reclaiming land from the ocean or digging out mountain sides to to build more tenements. I mean, it's uh, it's something that you know you step back and it's uh, it, it is quite jarring. You know, especially you know if you see pictures of as as it was you know uh, before it became such a big city here or in other places. It's it's, it's definitely it's um, it's quite something sometimes. Yeah. Um, so as, as we were talking about New Orleans, um, we actually, so we spoke with uh, Nathaniel Rich uh, quite recently about his new book. 
uh, and he's out, he's lives in New Orleans. And so he spoke to, uh, to that uh, topic a little bit with us. But what I want to ask about was, um, you mentioned it quite briefly, and he dedicated some space to it, the resurrection of the passenger pigeon, mm -hmm. um, which I just find, you know, fascinating just as a, from a, you know, it's, it, it's just the, the gene editing part of it is just something that is, is something I don't think a lot of people really, you know, know about. And it's, it's something that is quite, you know, astonishing that we're able to do such a thing. Um, but you call it a genetic rescue. And do you think that, you know, since in the case of the passenger pigeon, we were, we as humans were kind of responsible for their extinction in the first place? Uh, is it, is there some ethical kind of responsibility on our end to bring them back if we have the technology to do so? Well, I, I'll say a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I, I, genetic rescue is not my term. I mean, that that's a term mm. out there in the world of um, conservation biology has that. And, and I think it means different things to different people, honestly. It can mean, um, you know, if a species is, let's say, fragmented down to, you know, populations that cannot interact anymore and so you're you know you have restricted gene flow at this point um, and you're getting kind of inbred populations you could maybe facilitate you know breeding between the different populations that might count as genetic rescue um, in the case of you know actually uh, you know genetically rescuing a species that doesn't exist anymore um, you know, it's a very interesting idea that's gotten a lot of play because it's so fascinating and you, you could argue just so cool. The practicalities of it, however, are at this moment in time, you know, way beyond us. I mean, the effort to, um, you know, resurrect the passenger pigeon, uh, it, it really doesn't exist at this point. You know, it was, it was a, an interesting intellectual exercise to think through what you might have to do. Uh, gene editing birds is, is pretty difficult because of the way they, they reproduce. Uh, I won't go into the details of how complicated it is, but it's quite complicated. And what you'd have to do, once again, in theory, you would you have the passenger pigeon genome. That, that's not that hard. We're pretty good now at um, sequencing DNA from uh, creatures that are dead, you know, as long as they didn't die too long ago, how's that? So the passenger pigeon, you know, existed until the end of the 19th century. So we have a lot of, you know, bones. We can we can probably, you know, get a pretty big, good picture of its genome, and then we take its nearest relative, uh, and we um, tweak, try to tweak its genome at all the places that, you know, passenger pigeons have diverged. Um, but that's probably thousands of locations, you know. So we are talking about something that is simply not possible at this moment in time. Will it become possible? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that one. That's that's a really hard one. How's that? But let's even imagine that it it will. So then you have to ask yourself, you know, the passenger pigeon. Uh, why did the passenger pigeon go extinct? No one, no one is really entirely sure about that. Um, but one of the questions, the big questions about the passenger pigeons. Uh, is, you know, they, they congregated in these huge flocks. That's what they were, they were sort of known for, these amazing clouds right. of passenger pigeons that blocked the sun as they passed overhead. Was that, were those huge numbers necessary for its survival? Uh, and if so, you know, did it go extinct? Not because we killed off every last one, which actually would have been rather difficult, but because something in the way that it reproduced was disrupted um, as the numbers dropped and eventually it just died out. We don't know the answers to that, but if it's true, you know, creating a couple of passenger pigeons isn't going to bring the species back. You know, the species depended on something uh, to keep it going. Um, you know, uh, what was it? So, so in general, you know, if you're trying to bring back a species, you have to ask the question, why did it go extinct in the first place? And have we uh, ameliorated the situation to the extent that that species could survive um, again? And then 
just to raise another problem, and I'll stop there, you know, a species isn't just its genome. You know, you are not just your genome. Animals, um, even, you know, pretty far down what we would call the evolutionary tree, they, they learn from their parents. Birds certainly learn from their parents. So if you're a passenger pigeon being raised by, you know, a band-tailed pigeon or whatever it is, is are, are you really a passenger pigeon? You know, it's very difficult to see how you would teach those behaviors when we don't even know exactly what those behaviors were. That's true. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's almost a, a, a no uh, no going back in in some ways on kind of these these more monumental changes that that have happened to the to the biosphere in, in those ways. Um, but I mean, this technology is 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 always you know it's a uh, it's always interesting to keep an eye on. You know, it's always something that, yeah. Um, so, I mean, just kind of going off of that, uh, I wanted to touch real quick on the on the coral uh, chapter too. Um, something I definitely was not familiar with the the coral sex procedure. Um, uh, I learned something new, and um, uh, I wasn't aware of the assisted evolution methodology either. That was that was actually quite interesting and. And I guess kind of similar to the passenger pigeon question, is this, um, you know, this kind of this method of, of placing species under, you know, quite a bit of stress to kind of accelerate that evolution process? Um, in your research, I mean, what were the kind of ethical and, and moral arguments that, that surrounded that practice that you saw? Well, I think in the case of corals, I mean, there's, you know, we can, we can look at it from, from two angles. So corals don't like, they, they only live in, in warm water and tropical waters, but they don't like it when temperatures get out of a certain range uh, because um, they have a very important symbiotic relationship with the symbiotic algae and that relationship sort of breaks down in higher temperatures. Um, and that's what we're seeing with these coral bleaching events that we're seeing now, you know, practically all the time. And the prognosis for coral reefs, um, which are, you know, just these amazing places and, and really cradles of biodiversity is, is quite, quite bad. I don't think anyone would argue differently uh, as the world warms. We've already seen, you know, immense destruction of coral reefs. Um, so, you know, their question is what's, what are the alternatives? Now, uh, I don't, so I don't think anyone has really a very strong ethical argument against trying to, you know, breed up, let's say, uh, more heat resistant corals. I think um, they have pra more practical, uh, concerns, you know, it's just, it's just not, is it going to work? You know, could it possibly work? I mean, as you, you alluded to coral sex, which is an amazing um, event. So many corals, not all corals, but many corals are, are um, go through this mass spawning event once a year where they, uh, they're hermaphroditic and they release these sort of little beads that contain both eggs and sperm. And they have this sort of orgy out in the, in the, in the water. And there are tons and tons of crosses being made there, you know, many, many gametes meeting each other. And so one objection to assisted evolution is simply, well, look, if evolution were capable of producing a more heat-resistant coral, it would be doing that right now because, you know, nature is crossing way more corals than people could ever hope to cross. Now, the argument for assisted evolution is, well, yes, that's true, but there are certain corals from say different parts of the reefs or even different reefs that could not meet each other. They would not normally, you know, we're, we're basically playing, you know, match.com here. Um, and that's possibly, that's possibly true. And so these are, these are once again, open sort of scientific questions. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, just, uh, it, it is, it is interesting to think that these are kind of outcomes that would never really happen in nature you know these these corals that are you know miles and miles apart that they would never um yeah no obviously humans are extremely good at at breeding up you know 
creatures, we, we've, you know, changed so many organisms, everything, you know, that we see around us, the average, you know, if I look out in my own backyard, you know, the grass, the lilacs, you know, all these were bred up by people to have certain, you know, uh, characteristics that, that we like. Um, but the question of whether this, um, you know, I had to plant all that stuff. The question of whether you can kind of reseed or restore an ecosystem that way uh, is unclear. I mean, people do a lot of sort of coral restoration too. You know, they they take little chunks of coral, they they grow them up in a lat sort of farm setting or whatever in tanks, and then they put them back out on the reef. Um, you know that that works to a certain extent, but it's incredibly laborious. And, you know, the amount of territory that you can cover is very low mm. compared to what a natural reef, you know, would encompass. Right. Do you think, um, I mean, kind of like the, the passenger pigeon example, uh, are these more just kind of, you know, proof that, you know, we have the technology to kind of do these things like almost like a proof of concept uh instead of really like a, a a permanent fix that could that could really fix this issue you think it's kind of the same as that you know there's just there's definitely a certain amount of that and there's a lot of research out there that you know people are doing under the sort of banner of you know, saving a species or, or whatever. Then, and, and, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not being critical at all. I mean, it, I, I think it's very well intentioned, but they're also doing it because it's really interesting science. You know, so you can do a lot of really interesting science that, as you say, might prove that something's theoretically possible. But then, when you look at the practicalities, and you know, that was definitely a big issue in the, in the coral reef chapter. You know, I talked to people who were, who were trying to think through the practicalities. Let's say you could do this. You know. Imagine doing it at the scale of the Great Barrier Reef, which is the size of Italy, you know. Um, so we're not talking about, you know, a garden here. We're talking about a whole, you know, nation. And that, that scaling up problem, which is not the one that the, you know, lab folks worry about, but which is one that, you know, groups like the Marine, um, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority are actually thinking about. Um, you know, the question of whether that's, those two things have anything to do with each other, really, once again, it's very much an open question. That, right. that lab work and the actual, you know, work out on the reef. Right, definitely. And, and it doesn't get any easier when you still have, you know, oil tankers and, and, and gas tankers, you know, coming out of port right behind them. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it doesn't get any easier. I mean, as many, many, you know, coral biologists would say, uh, look, until you basically stop emitting CO2, you know, things are just going to get worse and worse on the reef. And you can, you know, you just have to be honest and face up to that. Um, so we should be putting our, all of our efforts into simply reducing CO2. Um, but other people would point out, and, and, and I think once again, both sides make a very good point. Other, other coral biologists would point out, well, it doesn't matter even if we stopped emitting CO2 right now, we would still, reefs would be facing a very uh, uncertain future. So we need to be working on these things if we want to preserve reefs through this century uh, until a time when hopefully, you know, we will have stabilized climate. Um, so those are both, I think, very powerful arguments. Right, definitely. Um, so moving on to kind of the more futuristic kind of technologies that you talk about, right? Like carbon capture, geoengineering. Um, you even mentioned nuclear fusion briefly at one point. And um, uh, you make this really interesting distinction towards the end between the techno-optimism and techno-fatalism. And you say that, you know, a lot of the experts who you spoke with were more techno fatalist, you know, saying that uh, we have to do this, not really because we think we we should do this, but we, we're accepting that we have to. Um, but what I'm wondering is that you know a lot of these more futuristic technologies, they're championed quite famously by 
you know, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, you know, these, these, these figures who have been criticized for perceivably, you know, having overly techno-optimist views. Um, so do you think that uh, kind of where do, where do the Gates and the Bezos of the world uh, come in? Do they have kind of the same motivations as, as the scientists and all the experts that you spoke with, or is it a whole other class of, of, uh, of, of concerns, you think? Well, I think there's definitely a very, you know, large group of people and a bunch of them happen to be very rich and have very large, you know, megaphones who are, who, you know, do fall into that, well, whatever we need to invent, we will invent category. Um, those people, um, you know, tend to be in the, they don't tend to be in the sort of academic world where most of the people that I spoke to, not, not all, I mean, some of the people that I spoke to were out in the sort of entrepreneurial space. Um, but most of them were, were academics interested in, you know, some pretty basic questions. And I think it's very, as we discussed before, it's very dangerous to assume the answer to your question, you know, to assume that technology is going to save us. Um, now, that being said, someone like Bill Gates is, is putting a lot of money uh, into trying to develop what he would argue are these crucial technologies. Um, you know, is, is that, uh, you know, some people would say, you know, that's terrible. <laughs> you know, these, these, this research shouldn't even be being done. This research on solar geoengineering shouldn't even be happening, you know. Um, but I think it's a hard argument to make that we shouldn't be doing research uh, uh, when we're in such on, you know, just about anything, <laughs> uh, when we're in such a terrible bind but that doesn't mean that we should use every you know technology that is theoretically possible once again there's there's like many many steps along here where, you know one is doing the research and finding out if things are technologically possible so in the case of solar geoengineering uh you know a lot of people would say so or some people would say a lot of scientists would say well we ought to know if it's even possible or not that that would be the first you know cut off <laughs> it's not possible then we're not going to, you know, we can't pursue it. It's not going to happen. Um, if it is possible, then another decision tree opens up, but that we should approach these decisions, you know, sort of logically, rationally. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, unfortunately, another and another group of people would argue, well, humans aren't rational. And if you simply dangle this possibility in front of them, it may be possible, it may not be possible. It will sort of encourage or license, you know, all sorts of bad behavior. And, you know, that's also... A, a reasonable argument. I think, once again, unfortunately, there are reasonable arguments on both sides, um, and the stakes are very high. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, you know, especially with uh, geoengineering, it's 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 hard to fall on either side of the argument and and say that the other side is wrong, um, you know, unequivocally, because there is definitely, you know, both sides make very solid points, um, and even though we tumble, you know, further and further towards the point where there's no more argument to be had, and it's just uh, something that must be done. But um, well, you can say that, but once again, you know, the interesting thing is we don't know if it can be done. You know, right. so they, they we get into these complicated, you know, circular arguments. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, and but there's there's another kind of argument out there that's uh, it's that we shouldn't really be the technological intervention should kind of be kept at a minimum, right? That we should just kind of let nature do its thing. And, you know, it'll run its course, regenerate kind of organically as best it can. Um, but, you know, we've obviously kind of reached the point where at least, you know, for our own purposes, uh, some degree of intervention is necessary, right? To just fix our own mistakes. Um, is uh, from a, a more kind of conservationist and, you know, like, Puritan naturalist um, point of view, is this kind of is is this enough to justify us manipulating, intervening with with nature with with our technologies? Well, I think you know, 
it's a it's a, it's not it's a really complicated question. I mean, is putting up, you know, is putting up solar panels, you know, that's has its own uh, ecological footprint, et cetera. Do we consider that, you know, intervening with nature? Well, uh, I don't. I think we would all say, well. You know, we've got to do that. Oh, I shouldn't say we all, but most of us who say, well, you know, unfortunately, we don't have any choice. You know, uh, we have to switch our energy systems. That has ecological consequences of its own. Um, that's a technological, you know, choice, changing technologies from fossil fuel burning technologies to carbon free. But there's no sort of free lunch here, as it were. And uh, in terms of, you know, should we leave things alone? It's we're on this kind of complicated continuum, you know. On the one hand, there's you know simply using a lot less of everything uh, and switching out our energy systems, um, all the way through. You know, should we gene edit species so that they can survive in a warmer world? And I don't think, and I think one of the sort of messages of the book is, unfortunately, there's no bright line here. There's no clear line where it says, okay, this intervention is okay. You know, we intervene all the time to try to save species. Um, you know, is that okay? <laughs> Should we be doing that? Should we just let them go extinct? You know, so where where's the line where we say our intervention here, let's stop intervening. It's not, once again, that's sort of the point of the book. We're in so deep that it's very difficult to say, okay, well now let's just pull back. What would that even mean? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and and it, and it was kind of it was it was it was a lot kind of hearing you know the the experts you spoke with the the scientists and people who spend their careers kind of answering these questions or trying to answer these questions come to those conclusions that uh, you know no this isn't ideal we might we probably shouldn't be doing this but we we're gotten to the point where we have to uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely, yeah, that, mu that must have been something to listen to yeah. all people <laughs> kind of go yeah, off. No, I, mean, I think it's important. You know, I do think that there are, you know, there are no easy answers here. You know, there, you, know you might want to say, you know, gene editing, uh, you know, there's a lot of anti-GMO sentiment out there. And... Mm -hmm. I understand that, and it's very creepy and Frankensteinian. But here, I'll, I'll offer an example, you know, of a choice uh, that is raised, um, and I allude to it in in passing in the book. There's a, you know, the American chestnut tree was done in by a fungal pathogen in the mm -hmm. sort of the middle of the 20th century. So every chestnut in the American chestnut tree, basically in the country, you know, like four billion trees were was killed off. And there was an attempt to sort of breed up a fungus resistant tree and it didn't, it didn't work terribly well. And now we have a um, genetically modified chestnut tree that has a gene from wheat, one, one gene basically from wheat uh, that can resist the fungus. Mm -hmm. uh, right now they've applied for permits. Can you, you know, could, they, could you plant these trees out in the world? And that's the choice that we have right now. You know, either no American chestnuts, or this genetically modified chestnut, and I don't think that's an easy call at all. Right, definitely. It's uh, it's like saying, you know, if if we can get to the point where we can regulate the temperature of our atmosphere, same way we regulate the temperature in our homes, um, sounds a little, a little extreme. But um, if it has to get to that point, yeah. Uh, I know we're we're running down on time real quick here, so I'll just wrap this up. Um, last few questions. So what is, um, first kind of what of all these kind of technologies that you bring up, you know, like biotech, geoengineering, uh, gene editing, what is the field of research that you came across or the technology that excites you the most kind of, you know, looking forward or that is the most promising in any way? Well, I think gene editing is incredibly powerful. We're only just beginning to see mm -hmm. what can be done, you know, in a, in a post CRISPR era. Um, and I think those questions, the questions of, you know, how far we want to go with that, um, 
especially with the technology known as gene drive, which I also do talk about in the book where, where you can really basically guarantee that a trait is passed on from generation to generation. Um, I think that's going to raise a lot of interesting possibilities that we're going to have to grapple with. Mm -hmm. Right, definitely. And uh, is there one that, that worries you the most or that you're most <laughs> anxious about? <laughs> well, I mean, Gina, I mean, they, they can be the same thing. I mean, gene editing is very, is very scary, you know, and I mean this, you know, if you look at like COVID and, you know, kind of a lab leak theory, which is, you know, quite probably not true, but I do think points to the power of, you know, bioweapons. And I mean, so every, all of these technologies have very, very dark sides and potential, potential military applications. And a lot of the money, uh, to be honest, that's going into it, uh, even in a conservation, from a conservation perspective, is, is basically military money, trying to figure out, okay, what is doable? What are our enemies doing? You know, uh, so it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty, you know, scary space. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that description of the, the lab in Australia was, uh, was something else. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. and, 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 uh, you know, we are very, very dependent on, you know, animal agriculture, you know, animal pathogens are constantly springing up. So, uh, the way we treat animals, the way we concentrate animals. I mean, it's like a recipe for, you know, disaster basically. Right. Uh, and just always also, you know, still like looking towards the future. What are you, cause I'm, I'm not entirely sure on when you wrote this book. You mentioned the uh, coronavirus a, a few times in passing, um, but given the kind of state of especially politics right now with, uh, you know, Joe Biden and like what's going on in Congress. What, um, are you a little bit more hopeful than you were when you wrote it or where, where do you stand right now? You know, I certainly think that the sort of day-to-day -day politics have improved in the U.S. though, you know, maybe not as much as you might hope um, because of a very, very evenly divided Congress. Um, but the big picture, you know, the macro picture, unfortunately, hasn't changed much since I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, it's quite, quite static, feels like. Um, great. And so last question. Uh, so what you're writing about, you know, both in this book and even in The Sixth Extinction, you know, is, uh, is essentially that, you know, you're talking about extinction and kind of the ways that we either you know, that we as humans are desperately trying to avoid it, you know, if not for ourselves, then for the sake of other species. Uh, and, you know, it is, it is a, you know, going back to the first question, you know, it is a hard subject matter to digest for, for anyone. Um, and in your line of work, kind of as, as a journalist covering these things, uh, how do you, how do you really, how, how do you find a way to cope kind of with, uh, with all these kind of things coming out because it is it is quite you know hard yeah. matter sometimes and um yeah yeah well i i i mean i guess in some ways i consider myself fortunate because i um you know it is such an important story it really couldn't be more important and um i you know, get to get to write about it, you know, for a living, that's, that's sort of a privilege in, in many, many ways. Now, how do I feel about, you know, looking at the future of the world and the future for my kids? I, you know, I have kids who are in their 20s. Um, you know, not good. It's, it's, I, I don't have any, you know, when kids often come up to me now, like, you know, 20 something, 30 somethings, and they, and they say, I, you know, I'm, I don't think I want to have kids, you know, the world is so messed up. And, you know, as, as a mom who would say there's really, you know, no experience I value more than having had kids. Uh, but I, I empathize with that a great deal. And I think that that is unfortunately a very uh, reasonable conclusion when looking at the world and when my own kids talk about, you know, not wanting to have kids. And that's, that's, very, very painful, obviously. Um, but I think that, 
you know, it's very, very hard. If you're not pessimistic about the future, you are not paying attention. How's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, um, yeah, and there's definitely a lot of that going around, but uh, I mean, one, one scene really, you know, stuck out of me in, in, in the book, you know, when, uh, uh, when the students were collecting the, the, the sperm and egg samples from the, from the coral and, uh, you know, just joking around about the, about, yeah. about the situation, which, yeah. you know, we would go yeah. back before saying, you know, this is just a very absurd kind of, you know, situation to be in, but. But yes, people just, find dark humor in everything. I mean, yeah. and and that's good. That's one of our that's one of our talents. Has that, and yeah. I think it's important to hold on to that. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and 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 yeah, even just being able to still appreciate, you know, the the beauty of these of these processes that you know that we're we're still lucky enough to see and hopefully protect. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that's uh, pretty much it on my end. Um, so. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for, for sharing you know, your knowledge and your insights with us uh, and with our audience. Uh, it's been a really great talk and you know, I hope we can speak again soon too. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me.